Hello and welcome back to a brand new video. To be honest, I thought I was done with the Ryzen 5000 CPUs after my three previous videos. But then I realized I forgot the Ryzen 5 CPU. So in this video, we'll be overclocking the Ryzen 5 5600X all six cores to 4.65 gigahertz using custom loop water cooling. The Ryzen 5 5600X is the lowest of the four products that were included in AMD's launch of the Ryzen 5000 processor family. The Ryzen 5000 is powered by the Zen 3 microarchitecture codenamed Vermeer. Vermeer is similar to the previous Zen generations and is also powered by a 7 nanometer process node. The main benefits can be found in the significantly increased performance per clock and increased frequencies at a similar power level. The CPU is still chiplet based and features the same I.O. die as the previous generations. The Ryzen 5 5600X offers 6 cores and 12 threads with a listed base frequency of 3.7 GHz and a listed boost frequency up to 4.6 GHz. It is rated at 65 watts TDP and should retail at an MSRP of 299 US dollar. The CPU should already be available since November 5 in stores around the world. In this video, we'll cover the basic steps required to get your CPU all the way to 4.65 GHz using custom loop water cooling. We'll be covering four different overclocking strategies. First, we'll simply enable Precision Boost Overdrive and XMP. Second, we'll push the CPU to its maximum Prime 95 with AVX enabled, stable settings. Third, we will push our CPU even further to its all core maximum stable frequency. Lastly, we'll try to big brain PBO and extract a little bit more performance. But first, let's have a look at the hardware that we use in this guide and the overclocking constraints we will be facing. Along with the AMD Ryzen 5 5600X processor, in this guide, we will be using the Gigabyte B550 RS Pro AX motherboard, an NVIDIA RTX 2080 Ti, a pair of G-Skill Trident Z DDR4 4266 memory sticks, a Seasonic Prime 850 watt platinum power supply, the Elmore Labs P80 DB2 LPC debug card, and of course, EK Quantum water cooling. All this is mounted on top of our favorite open bench table. The cost of the components should be about $3,000. That's $300 for the CPU, $600 for the cooling, $200 for the motherboard, $1,300 for the graphics card, $180 for the memory, $200 for the power supply, $30 for the debug card, and $200 for the bench table. Before we get started with the overclocking, let's have a look at the AMD technologies and the constraints we will face. A Ryzen 5000 CPU consists of a couple of parts. Each CPU has multiple chiplets. A chiplet is a die with specific functions such as CPU cores, IO hub, memory controller, and so on. All the chiplets communicate with each other via the fabric interconnect. A core chiplet die or CCD is one of the chips on the AMD CPU. While a CCD used to consist of two CCXs paired together, on Zen 3, a CCD consists of a single CCX. CCX is short for core complex. The core complex consists of eight individual cores, each with their L1 and L2 cache. They also share a large 32 megabyte L3 cache. The Ryzen 5 5600X has one CCD with one CCX. That one CCX has six out of the eight cores enabled. By default, the Infinity Fabric, Memory Controller and Memory Frequency will operate in synchronous mode. That means typically the CPU will run all the frequencies in a one-to-one -one ratio. On Ryzen 5000, synchronous mode is supposed to work all the way up to 2000 MHz, after which the system switches to asynchronous mode. In asynchronous mode, the memory controller will operate at half the frequency of the system memory. The fabric clock will also run below the system memory frequency, so you will have a performance penalty. The penalty can be overcome by increasing the memory frequency to well over DDR4 4000 speeds. 
With all this in mind, let's jump into the benchmarks and the overclocking. Here's a list of the benchmarks used in this guide. Super Pi 4M, Geekbench 5, HWOD X265, Cinebench R23, V-Ray 5, and Final Fantasy 14. Before we get started with pushing the performance of the AMD Ryzen 5 5600X processor, let's first take a look at the scoring at stock settings. As a first step, we wanted to enable Precision Boost Overdrive, but turns out this feature is by default enabled on this motherboard. So that makes it very easy. As a reminder, Precision Boost Overdrive aims to maximize the system performance in case you have adequate cooling and adequate components. The performance is determined by a variety of factors such as CPU temperature, type of workload, number of active cores, power consumption, current draw, and so on. When the processor has additional headroom, Precision Boost Overdrive will automatically raise the operating frequencies. XMP stands for Extreme Memory Profile and is actually an Intel technology. It allows memory vendors such as G-Skill to program higher performance settings onto the memory sticks. If your motherboard supports XMP, then you can enable the higher performance with a single BIOS setting. So it saves you from lots of manual configuration. Upon entering the BIOS, click on XMP Disabled and set it to XMP Profile 1, then click Save and Exit to confirm the settings. We re-ran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to default operation. There are two important notes to make. First, bear in mind that while by enabling XMP we have effectively doubled the memory frequency from DDR4-2133 to DDR4-4266, the Infinity Fabric and memory controller are still running at default frequency of 1066 megahertz. So we are running a synchronous mode. Second, as I mentioned in the beginning of this section, by default, this motherboard has Precision Boost Overdrive enabled. While some may disagree, I think this is the right decision since it offers much better performance to the user out of the box. Just so you have an idea of how much better the performance really is, I quickly disabled the turbo in the BIOS and checked the performance difference. Upon entering the BIOS, press F2 to enter the advanced mode view, then enter the advanced CPU settings submenu and disable core performance boost. Then save and exit the BIOS. As you can see, Precision Boost Overdrive is quite the treat when it comes to out of the box performance. Anyway, let's jump into the manual overclocking. In addition to overclocking the CPU to 4.4 GHz, we also enable XMP, but leave Infinity Fabric and the memory controller to default operation. So we're running a synchronous mode. Also, this is the highest setting that is stable for Prime95 with AVX. Upon entering the BIOS, change to the advanced mode view. Set CPU clock ratio to 44. Set extreme memory profile to profile one. Set CPU vCore to 1.25, then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to default operation. We can notice a couple of things. First, just like with the previous generation of Ryzen CPUs, we lose performance against default settings in single threaded light workloads. The reason is that by default, the frequency would boost to 4.6 and even 4.65 GHz, whereas with our manual overclock, we are limited to 4.4 GHz. Second, we can see a positive impact of the additional performance from running the system memory at much higher frequency using XMP. This helps overcome some of the deficit we see from the lower than default boost CPU frequency. Running Prime95 small F50 with AVX enabled at 4.4 GHz, we're seeing a peak CPU temperature of 93 degrees centigrade and a peak CPU package power of 102 watts. Now let's have a look at post Prime95 overclocking capabilities. If we ignore Prime95 with AVX, we can further push the CPU to 4.65 GHz while having XMP enabled and the Infinity Fabric and Memory Controller still at default settings. Upon entering the BIOS, change to the Advanced Mode view. Set CPU Clock Ratio to 46.5. Set Extreme Memory Profile to Profile 1. 
set CPU V core to 1.376 volts, then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to stock operation. As expected, the performance continues to rise. Most importantly, all our benchmarks are now above our stock performance. At this point, during my Ryzen 5 5600X overclocking journey, I was a little bit disappointed. Based on the overclocking results I have seen from the previous three videos, I was somehow expecting a little bit more overclocking headroom. But maybe I set myself up for disappointment because are you really meant to win the silicon lottery with a Ryzen 5 CPU? Not just a Ryzen 5 CPU, but it's also the only 65 watt rated part in the entire lineup. So in the end, having all cores overclocked to higher than the maximum turbo frequency to 4.65 gigahertz is still kind of nice. Anyway, I thought this was pretty much the end of the journey to find and extract more performance from the CPU, but then I had an idea. What if we can big brain precision boost overdrive and extract a little bit more performance. See, this is what you need to know about precision boost overdrive. While AMD has shared some information on how this technology works, the exact algorithm hasn't really been shared with the public, so we don't really know exactly what happens. But here's what we do know. The precision boost overdrive algorithm takes into account information from various sources. The sources include a wide range of on-die sensors that monitor temperature, current, core usage, and so on, as well as the pre-programmed information such as the maximum boost frequency. Funny tidbit is that the advertised maximum boost frequency is actually slightly lower than the programmed max boost frequency. For example, on this 5600X, the advertised max turbo boost is 4.6 gigahertz, and the maximum program frequency, also known as Fmax, is 4.65 GHz. Another great example is the 16-core 5950X, which appears to have an Fmax of 5050 MHz, while only having an advertised boost of 4.9 GHz. Anyway, let's go back to the precision boost overdrive algorithm. Based on all of these inputs, the algorithm determines the available voltage headroom and frequency to maximize system performance. Typically, the better your cooling, the more headroom you have. The key takeaway from all this is that the CPU frequency will be limited by its pre-programmed Fmax, regardless of how amazing your cooling is. In this case, we have paired our 65 watt Ryzen 5 6 core with a pretty high-end custom loop water cooling. So, there should be plenty of headroom left in the die. So what is the big brain play I hear you asking? Well, remember when I said the programmed if max is the absolute limit? A light, sort of. There's a way to offset the maximum turbo boost using an option called F max offset. F max offset is an option that allows you to raise the F max ceiling of your processor in steps of 25 megahertz up to 200 megahertz. So, in the case of the 5600X, from 4.65 GHz to 4.85 GHz. Upon entering the BIOS, change the advanced mode view, set extreme memory profile to profile 1, then navigate to the settings menu. Enter the AMD overclocking submenu. Press accept. Enter the precision boost overdrive submenu. Change the precision boost overdrive option to advanced then change the max CPU boost clock override to 200 MHz, then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to default operation. By simply lifting the ceiling of the F-Max and using top-notch cooling, we were able to increase the performance of light workloads by quite a bit. Hey guys, it's editing Peter here. So while I was preparing for the video and gathering all the data, I also got around to making some charts, which I think will help you better understand how precision boost overdrive works, in particular the frequency and the voltage. So I used hardware info to track the frequency and the voltage during two back-to-back -back runs of Geekbench 5. Geekbench 5 is great for this purpose because it's a mixture of single and multi-threaded workloads, heavy and, and, and light workloads. So you can really see the PBO algorithm in, in action. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, let me jump to the charts. I collected information on three types of data, VID, core frequency, and effective clock. VID is the core voltage that's requested by the CPU. It's very straightforward. Core frequency is the frequency that's configured by the CPU and read from the CPU registers. So typically, this will be the frequency that you'll see pop up in CPU-Z, for example. Effective clock measures the average actual clock across the polling interval. The difference between the two values is that the core frequency is the frequency as measured at one specific moment in time, whereas the effective clock measures the total of clock cycles between those two moments in time. These two measurements can differ a lot because modern CPUs like Ryzen 5000 have very advanced power saving features. When a CPU core has nothing to execute, it will quickly go to a low power state. This is great because that opens up more power budget for any of the other cores that do need to execute. So those other cores may boost to a higher frequency. So let's have a look at the frequency behavior. I took all the data points of the operating frequency of each core at every timestamp and placed them in a bucket of 50 megahertz ranging from 3 gigahertz to 4.85 gigahertz. We find that with automatic PBO, the core frequency throughout the two benchmark runs is at base frequency about 35% of the time and spends about 20% of the time at the F max of 4.65 gigahertz. Hitting the maximum frequency so often is a great indication that most likely there's plenty of headroom left in the CPU. PBO with FMAX offset of 200 megahertz has the CPU configured about 20% of the time at 4.65 to 4.85 gigahertz and almost 10% of the time at the maximum frequency. So my gut feeling here tells me that maybe there's even more headroom left in the CPU, but there's simply no way to extract that extra performance. Looking at the effective clock, we find that actually about 75% of the time, one or more cores are idling at low power and low frequency. Think about that. While running the benchmark, 75% of the time, the cores are idling. That's very generous of those cores as they open up the opportunity for the cores that are doing tasks to hit higher frequencies. If we zoom in on the boost frequency range, we can see that the actual time spent at an effective clock of 4.65 gigahertz or above is 2.55% for automatic precision boost overdrive and 3.71% with that FMAX offset, so slim margins. Then I also took all the data points of the VID of each core at every timestamp and placed them in buckets of 15 millivolts ranging from 0.9 volt to 1.47 volt. We can make two more key observations. The first observation is that we can see the PBO algorithm working fine when we're using this if max offset. We lifted the frequency ceiling and then the algorithm, which has access to an extended voltage range, can enable that additional frequency. Interestingly, the highest measured VID for the automatic PBO is 1.38 volts for 4.65 gigahertz. And the highest measured VID for PBO with the F max offset is 1.45 volts for 4.85 gigahertz. The second observation is that the PBO algorithm will increase the voltage well beyond 1.4 volts. I'm sure it makes some people watching this video uncomfortable as the common recommendation would be to keep the voltage below or around 1.3 volts. Well, it just proves that higher voltage by itself is not an issue. It's under which conditions the voltage is applied. In this case, the voltage range extends from 1.38 volt to 1.45 volt for frequencies from 4.65 gigahertz to 4.85 gigahertz. But from our previous chart, we know that the time spent at these frequencies is about 3%. So for light workloads that don't hit the power or the thermal constraints set by PBO, the algorithm finds that setting over 1.4 volts is perfectly fine. All right, let's wrap this video up. I am glad we finally got around to covering all of the AMD CPUs that were included in the Zen 3 launch. My expectation for the Ryzen 5 5600X, based on the experience with the three other CPUs, was to end up around 4.7 or 4.8 gigahertz. But we didn't quite get there. We got to 4.65 gigahertz 
which is still good considering that the maximum advertised boost frequency is 4.6 gigahertz. When it comes to manual overclocking, as I pointed out in my previous videos, Zen 3 is not that much different than Zen 2. That is, you know, if you're going to be tuning for an absolute worst case scenario like Prime 95 with AVX, you're going to be losing out on a lot of single threaded performance. My recommendation for the 5600X would be stick with Precision Boost Overdrive and enable XMP for a little bit better performance. If you have a great cooling solution, then look into FMAX offset to raise the ceiling of the PBO and find even more additional performance. If you have a great cooling solution and you somehow won the silicon lottery and your CPU can do over 4.65 GHz with all cores, then just go for that option. All right, that's it for this video. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the comment section below. I try to answer as many as, as possible and until the next time.